Welcome to Salvation and Catastrophe, a new YouTube series uh, that will be edited and administrated by me, Konstantinos Travlos, which will cover the events of the Greek-Turkish War from 1919 to 1923 with an extension to 1924 um, on a monthly basis, every month, what happened exactly 100 years ago. The inspiration for the show is obviously the excellent show, the Great War series on YouTube by Indiana Nidel and his team of uh, co-workers who did a great job. So essentially I'm picking up where they're ending and covering a specific conflict in the Eastern Mediterranean and aftermath of the peace to end all wars, which in this case did not do that. I am not going to be producing a very professional series. Unfortunately, I am a full-time academic and I'm busy with my teaching and research uh, responsibilities. That's why this is going to be a monthly show rather than a weekly show like The Great War. Um, so this is going to be pretty much an amateur effort. Uh, as things move along, I'll become better at this probably get some nicer props, um, maybe a nicer corner in the room which I can make look into like a studio. Uh, there'll be animations, there'll be maps, but don't expect the kind of cool stuff you got from Indy. There will be though, one similarity between the Great Sword series and Salvation and Catastrophe and that is the fact that both me and Indy really like our waste coasts. Uh, now, uh, another thing I have to point out, I am not a professional historian by trade. I'm a political scientist. I wanted to be a historian, but let's say higher powers blocked that effort. Uh, but within political science, I tend to do mostly historical, long-term temporal studies of international relations, and I specialize in the study of peace and conflict. So I'm not totally alien to what's going on here. I'm also interested in history from an amateur scholarly point of view. I've authored a couple of short articles for the foreign correspondent. Uh, I am working on an edited academic volume with scholars from the United States of America, Turkey and Greece on the centenary of the onset of the Greek-Turkish War, within which I'm actually working on a chapter on Eleftherios Venizelos and uh, the motivations that led to his decisions that led to this war. Now, uh, what are we going to do in this channel? The minimum I promise to do is to cover chronologically every month the events that happened on that month a hundred years ago. Uh, my intention is to produce videos either in the last week of the current month or the first week of the next month that essentially does a retrospection of everything that happened on that month a hundred years ago. Uh, now, if I have time, if I have support, if I have help, if you guys actually like what I'm trying to do here, which doesn't necessarily mean I'm gonna do well, but if you like ultimately what I produce here, there'll be a lot more stuff. I hope to do some specials on personalities that are important to the world, not just the big names like Mustafa Kemal Pasha or Ataturk or Eleftheris Venizelos, but uh, some of the less known protagonists of this conflict. Uh, examples would be, for example, on the Turkish side, uh, Kazim Karabekir Pasha. Uh, in the Greek side, uh, Steriadis, the High Commissioner of Greece in uh, Smyrna slash Izmir, and so on. Also specials on the political situation, on the diplomatic situation, and so on. I will not cover the Franco-Turkish conflict in Cilicia, uh, Kilic uh, as it's known in Turkish, and I will not cover the conflict between the Turkish Nationalist Movement in Anatolia and the First Armenian Republic in depth, so I will probably talk about that. Uh, I will offer you links and ideas about books. There is going to be actually a link that you can find in the description or over here, uh, which leads to a blog page where I have uploaded a number of uh, links to books as well as whole documents if they were publicly available. A couple of things now. There are a lot of people who produce historical shows on YouTube that claim to be objective. 
Uh, the only thing I know about the study of history is that objectivity is impossible. I don't remember exactly where I got that. That is a term quote uh, from an actual historian, either in the foreword of the Habsburg Empire a New History or in the foreword of the recent uh, book Liberty and Death about the French Revolution. Uh, objectivity in the study of history is impossible. Anybody who claims to be objective, to use an objective sources, is essentially not understanding history very well. And I'm sorry that a non-professional historian has to point that out, but this isn't me saying this, these are actually historians saying this. But you know what is possible? Honesty. I claim and I promise that I will be honest in my coverage. I will talk about the facts. I will talk about the conflicting interpretation of facts. I'll make sure to try and provide both sides of the story. Actually, as we're going to see here, there's going to be multiple sides of the story. So that's what I can promise you. Honesty. Uh, because let's be frank. I'm a Greek living in Istanbul uh, who doesn't know very well Turkish. So me even attempting to claim objectivity would be ridiculous. So I will promise honesty. Now, I can read Greek, English, French and a couple of Italians. I do not know a lot of Turkish. I apologize for that. Unfortunately, with my work, I did not have time to take Turkish courses, but I have friends and people, some of whom are actual professional historians who are Turks and they will help with some of the Turkish sources. So rest assured, everybody is going to get a say into this story. Um, let me give you an example of the idea of honesty over here. That's about the naming of the show. Why am I calling it the Greek-Turkish War of 1919-1922? In Turkey, it's known as the Western Front of the Turkish War of Independence. Uh, Batic FSC, Turk Istiklal Harbi, or Batic FSC, Turk Kuturlus Savashi. In Greece, it is known as the Asia Minor Campaign, and much more rarely as the Asia Minor War. Mikrasiatiki Ekstratia, e o Mikrasiatikos Polemos. The reason for this difference in names is that there is a different interpretation of what happened in this era between the two people. For the Turkish uh, nationalist historical point of view, uh, during this conflict, the Turkish nationalist movement was resisting a coordinated imperialist assault against the independence of the Muslim population of Asia Minor, in which Greeks, Armenians, the Caliphate, the Sultan, uh, Kurdish rebels, all were essentially pawns of the great imperialist powers. Uh, England, the United Kingdom back then, France and Italy, who were essentially trying to turn the Ottoman Empire into the equivalent of uh, contemporary Iran. A country of limited sovereignty divided in uh, spheres of influence, essentially a colonial power. Uh, historically, uh, Mustafa Kemal uh, Pasha, or Ataturk as he became later well uh, known, uh, said that uh, if the Turks would fail to win this conflict, he wrote this to Kazim Karabekir, I believe, uh, the Turkish soldiers would end up fighting colonial wars for the British throughout the world. Uh, so for the Turkish point of view, the Greek conflict was just part of a major coordinated assault. Uh, and there wasn't really any real Greek reasons. The Greeks were either tricked or bought off to attack the Turks. There were no real intrinsic Greek interests within the area. They were not independent actors. The image, of course, in Greece is completely different. Uh, of course, there are some people on the left, especially on the Communist Party, the older Communist Party, that take that view that the Greek campaign in Asia Minor was an imperialist war. But the mainstream view is that the Greeks uh, were going to Asia Minor in order to protect the livelihood and the property and the lives of the Ottoman Greeks who were at danger 
from the nationalist movement, which was nothing more than a continuation of the policies of the Committee of Union and Progress Party, Itihad Veteraki, also known in Greece as the Comitato. So there was a view that this was a war of liberation, that it was already independence. And unlike the Turkish view, where the various forces opposed to the nationalist movement were all coordinating very well between them, the Greeks stressed that there was no coordination. The United Kingdom was supportive, but it never really participated in the military conflict in a serious way. It gave money to the Greeks, it gave weapons to the Greeks, but it didn't actually give any Allied troops. And France and Italy were always acting to undermine the Greek position, especially after the November elections. There was no cooperation or coordination with the Armenians. Uh, there was no coordination or cooperation with the Ottoman government, especially under Damat Ferit Pasha. There was no cooperation with the Kurdish tribes and so on. The Greeks essentially were fighting by themselves against a nationalist movement that was supported by at least two one great power, Italy, and the resurgent Soviet power. Here's the thing. As we're going to see from our chronology, both of these interpretations are based on facts. But if you try to build an objective history here, you will be missing the point. Instead, I'm being honest. I can't call this war the Asia Minor campaign because it will completely negate the fact that, yes, indeed, Greece was cooperating with great powers that were seeking uh, economic and power politic interests. I can't call this war just the Western Front of the Turkish War of Independence because the reality of the matter is, especially after November, the Greeks were undermined by their supposed allies. They really were not that much supported uh, when it comes to material and economics by the British. And there was never really that much coordination between, let's say, the Greeks and the French in Cilicia or the Greeks and the Armenians. So instead, I use the term the Greek Turkish War. It is the term that is used in the Anglophone International Encyclopedias of Conflict, whether we're talking about the Claude's of War data set or Claude Felter's uh, Encyclopedia of Military Conflict. And it does capture a real element that this was mainly a war between the Greeks and the Turks, not just between the Greek state and the Greek government and the army and forces of the Grand Turkish, uh, the Turkish Grand National Assembly, but also a war between the populations. As we're going to see, there was a lot of killing happening between Greek Adartes, rebels, especially Ottoman Greek refugees returning to Asia Minor to reclaim their properties, and uh, Turkish Muslim uh, Mili Kuvay uh, or Chetes. So it was a broad war. That's why I'm choosing this term. It is not an objective term. It negates part of the story that is acceptable to Greeks and to Turks. But it is a term that I believe is honest. And that is the conflict we're going to cover here. A couple of other things on naming conventions. Wherever possible, I will use the name for cities that uh, were used by both the Greeks and the Turks. So, for example, Smyrna will also be called Izmir. On the other hand, for Istanbul, I will actually use a name that was uh, primarily used by everybody almost back then, which was Constantinople, or in its Ottoman form, Constantinia. Uh, when it comes to the names of uh, Turkish political and military leaders, I am going to primarily use the name that used during the era of the war. Uh, as you all know, uh, Ottoman Muslims gained uh, surnames much later in the First Republican era. So while the first time I introduce a personality, I'll make sure to also point out the surname by which they are known in modern Turkish history. After that, I will focus mostly on using the name they were known back then. So Mustafa Kemal Ataturk will mostly be called Mustafa Kemal Pasha which is the name he had when he won this great victory. Uh, Ismet Inonu will be called Ismet Pasha, so I cannot promise that I will always stick to this exactly. Uh, again, 
uh, it's not completely unbiased, but I think I'm being honest enough here. So, uh, I'll see you next in the end of October, where we're going to cover the armistice at Mudros or Mondros, plus the resignation of Ottoman Grand Vizier Talat Pasha, and essentially the supposed end of the fighting in World War I. If you like what I'm doing, remember to like the video and subscribe. Until then, stay well, 